Uh, so there definitely will not be enough time to talk fully about the pen genome, but hopefully this will leave everyone a little bit more curious than confused. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the changing in sequencing technology, particularly in the past few years, on why this has really changed genome assembly. I'll talk a little bit about why pen genomes are still very exciting, but not a magic trick. And finally, I'll wrap up with some interesting examples, hopefully, from the Bovine Pen Genome Consortium. So the first thing to really talk about, although hopefully everyone is kind of on the same page here, is that genomes are just one layer of information that represent an individual. Generally, for mammals, we're talking about something like billions of nucleotides split into different chromosomes. And a reference genome is basically just a single representative genome sequence that we can use, such that many different groups across the world, when they work on the same species, we can all talk about the same position, the same gene, the same variant. And this is very useful because we can then align our sequencing reads to the reference genome, and from this we can call variants. So in this case, our sequencing reads have these um, two green SNPs, so we can call that there is a mutation at this point. And genome assembly really has changed. Again, in the past few years, this was once a monumental effort for something like the Human Genome Project that took you know, dozens of international labs, you know, millions of dollars. Nowadays, it's really become quite simple. And because long reads have become both very long and very accurate, kind of like building a puzzle, it's much easier if you have big pieces. There's no discussion about this piece belongs somewhere in the sky. There's enough detail that we can replace all of these complex regions and get very high quality assemblies. And we can see through something like this paper, they even talk about it being semi-automated. So really not only is it much faster and much cheaper, it's also much easier. We have very little need to do too much manual curation. As long as we have the right data type, we can really start to produce dozens of high quality genomes, from even for a, a small lab, as long as you can afford the sequencing. The question now is now that we have all of these assemblies, what do we really do? And the key here is we want to try and integrate them together into what we call a pan genome, just meaning all genome. So here, if we have three different sequences, we can try and identify the regions where they're the same and find these regions where they're different. So in this case, the top two genomes look similar in the first box, whereas the third genome has a TT instead of a GC, and so on. And then we try and collapse it together. So we keep the regions that are similar as just single pieces of sequence. And then we represent differences between the genomes as uh, these sort of nodes and edges in a graph. So we can see if we go along this pan genome graph, if we took the top root, our sequence would have the GC type variant. And if we took the bottom path, it would have the TT type variant. And this is a way that we can take many different genomes and encode them all in one place such that we know again, where the similarities are between these genomes and where the differences are. And again, there's many details that we won't really get into today, but there's also a very interesting question about how much pen genomes have to actually represent the input genomes. So for something like a reference genome, we really want it to be as complete as possible. We want every piece of sequence we could have in this reference genome in there so it's the most useful for everyone else. In pen genomes, this isn't entirely the case. We still are working out some of these details, but some pen genomes really only look at entire genes. So something like pen gene builds pen genomes only using genes. Minigraph takes a single reference genome and then only adds in larger structure variation. Whereas some more traditional um, approaches like PGGB or Cactus, these are fully faithful to the input genomes. They include every single base from every single genome. The tricky thing here is PGGB and Cactus will build pan genomes that are very complex and very large because they store all this information. Or on the other hand, something like Minigraph or PanGene are much easier to work with because they only take certain pieces of information. So again, if we have say 100 or even 1000 genomes, do we really need every last drop of information? And this is still an open question, like I was saying, that we need to see what's the right level of detail that's actually useful. Of course, there are many other types of graphs based on Kamer's minimizers looking at conserved sequence and so on. And really the key thing that again, I don't think people really believed a few years ago is there really isn't going to be one type of pan genome that we'll want to have as 
the universal reference. Really, depending on the type of analysis you want to do, different levels of detail in the graph will be better for certain types of analyses than other. So again, it's highly unlikely that we'll really end up with just one pen genome for everything. There's also two different ways that we can consider pen genomes. So one of them is as a reference um, sort of replacement for a linear reference genome, where when we have this additional diversity within the pen genome, we can then still align short read DNA or any other um, type of sequencing reads against this pen genome and hopefully benefit from the additional diversity in the graph to find the correct place for, say, previously unrepresented reads. The other type is to treat the pen genome itself as the final downstream product. You know, if we have many different genomes in our pen genome, there will be a lot of interesting diversity across, say, different breeds or different species. So rather than using this pen genome as the starting point for an analysis, we can start to investigate it directly and just look for what's already contained within the pen genome. And these are not mutually exclusive, but they generally, again, will have different approaches for how to build them depending on which type of question we're trying to address. And again, I don't want to put myself out of a job, but I think people often think of pen genomes as the solution to problems that we you know, come up with every day. But pen genomes are very quickly just becoming a buzzword, kind of like quantum was back in the day, where um, you just put it in a presentation title or you put it into your paper to make it sound more interesting. It's worth remembering that pen genomes ultimately are just a collection of genome assemblies coming from sequencing data. And the end result for many pen genome analysis is just some type of genomic variation. So this is something that we've been doing for dozens of years. There's not fundamentally that much different when we work with pen genomes. That being said, they are helpful in some different contexts in replacing what we could not previously do. So one of these is mitigating what we call reference bias, where if we have sequencing reads that look more similar to a reference genome, so containing mutations at the same places, but we have, on the other hand, dissimilar sequencing reads that have, say, different mutations at those locations, it's really hard for a genome aligner to tell when sequencing reads are in the right place but just look very bad, or if they're in the wrong place where if we can represent different alleles in our pan genome, it often can help reads align to the correct place, reducing false positives and increasing uh, what was previously unmapped reads. So pan genomes do have uses, but again, it's worth remembering that this is ultimately something that we've all been doing for a long time, just in a slightly different way. However, there's one part that I think is particularly more interesting, especially for those who work in agriculture, but we can only really talk about variation with respect to the reference genome. So if we are trying to talk about some sort of interesting trait locus that wasn't already in the reference genome, there is no way we can talk about this. It does not have coordinates that we can you know, share across labs or talk. So for example, for cow, the reference genome is based on a Hereford animal. But if we know that there's some sort of large insertion in a different breed like Angus, and we know that two different Angus genomes somehow differ within this insertion, there's no way that we can talk about this SNP between Angus because the sequence does not exist in the reference genome. We're in a pan genome and we can include this non-reference sequence. It gives us a new way of talking about this non-reference sequence in a proper coordinate format. So we can still then talk about how Angus can differ from Angus, Angus can differ from Hereford, and really do a much better job considering we know that these breeds have very substantial differences between them. Of course, this has uh, you know, sort of an upper bound. If we have too much variation in our graph, um, it again just becomes too complicated to work with. But the key thing is we really want some way that we can reference the same location across different graphs. And this is a very recent and very unexplored idea called personalized pen genomes, where the rough idea is that we would start for many different samples with the same large complicated graph. And then we would basically remove pieces from the graph that were not relevant to that specific sample or that specific breed. The key difference here is because we're starting from the same graph, we can reference the same nodes, the same coordinates in our pen genome. 
So the graph is a little bit more useful. It functions very well for individual samples. But ultimately, when I talk about my variation and you talk about your variation, we still know how that relates. If instead we all had our own reference genomes, it would be the best for our own projects, but we would never be able to compare across our projects. And this is sort of where we're working at the moment for the Bovine Pan Genome Consortium, where really the hope is that we can come up with a community agreed pan genome representation to avoid the need of jumping into breed specific reference genomes. Because if every breed had their own reference genome, we would basically lose the ability to you know, discuss bovine genomics at a much larger scale. And the hope here is that by representing global diversity, so I'm collecting many different breeds across the world, and we have different working groups um, set up in different regions, the hope is that we can put as much diversity into this graph and get as much useful information out for everyone all at once, rather than again having you know, 15 different small working groups we're still ultimately all contributing to the same overall goal. And some quick examples, one of them is this interesting white-headed phenotype that we've seen in some cows. So the two cows on the right both have colored bodies, but white heads. Uh, and when we were realigning short read sequencing from public databases against our pan genome graph, so the part in the middle, we saw there was a very large difference in the coverage that the animals that have white heads have much more reads mapping to this complex region that's near the kit locus. So this was quite useful because if you look at the linear alignments for this region, it's an absolute mess. It's too complicated and there's too much variation between the animals we were looking at and the reference genome that we were not able to resolve this. But when we included the diversity in the pan genome and we were able to map to these coordinates not represented in the reference, we are able to distinguish the differences between these breeds. And of course, so far we've only talked about cattle, but bovines are a much more general um, set of species. And many of these are also very economically important in different regions. So we could talk about bison, bantang, gael, yak, buffalo. But the question is how far is too far? You know, if we include all the diversity across all these different species, again, will the graph just become too complex, too messy for us to actually use? And this is, a, again, a very open question at the moment that if we start looking too far, you know, does including buffalo help our analysis looking only at cattle? And I hope the answer will be yes, because then again, we can work more closely across very different species, but it might be the case that we don't have the right algorithms or the right technology to look at such diversity at the moment. And as another example, we were able to do this in bison um, because we were including them in one of our earlier graphs. But the pan genomes themselves, again, contain variation. So we can just immediately ask, does any of this variation within the graph overlap genes? And we saw this was the case for THRSP. So this is a thyroid hormone response protein. And what we saw is that the first exon for this protein was in a location that was uh, present in cattle and yak, but deleted in bison. And we can do this uh, much more generally. So this was based on a handful of samples that we had assemblies for, but we looked again to public databases and aligned short read sequencing from hundreds of samples. And you can see that this region is always missing and only missing in bison. So it's present in both cattle and in buffalo. So this is a specific deletion to the bison lineage. And again, we didn't really have to do much work here. All we had to do was look in the graph and see where these, uh, you know, the nodes and edges where they have this bubble type structure when this overlaps a gene. And this is a very simple problem that can give us some very interesting analyses to follow up on soon. So as a quick reminder, hopefully everyone is a little bit inspired by pan genomes. They do offer a slightly different angle to explore the flood of new data. Because really, we are going to have way more genome assemblies as they become more and more accessible and cheaper and cheaper for all labs to produce, that we need a way that we can handle having long read assemblies rather than just genotyping arrays. Pan genomes are very useful for how we can mitigate reference bias and also better represent global diversity. The cattle reference genome is based on Hereford, which is a Western European cow. But of course, there's many other different cows uh, across the world 
that if we can somehow make a better pen genome for the entire community, this is certainly going to be a good thing. And again, the main thing we really want to avoid is a fragmentation of the community where each group will be working on their own specific reference genomes and we lose the ability to work together. And interestingly, um, in some of the initial results we've got from the Bovine Pen Genome Consortium, the definition of breed is really messy when you start looking with um, some of these recent breeds or hybrid breeds or something along those lines. So the question is, through a pen genome, what happens if we don't really need to strictly define a breed anymore? Really what we care about is having the variation accessible for us to examine in a downstream case. And if the pen genome can contain all this variation, it doesn't really matter what the breed is, as long as we can find out you know, whatever the answers are that we need to look for. So hopefully that will be the case. But again, this is very untested work that hopefully over the next few years, we'll see more exciting and proven cases come from. And I'll just wrap up by thanking Hubert Pausch, my supervisor in the Animal Genomics Lab and the Bovine Pen Genome Consortium. Thank you.